I've had two pressing questions put to me this week by multiple individuals who were here last Sunday or who listened to last Sunday's talk. Last Sunday was the second in this series that I've entitled The Path is Made by Walking based on the Emmaus Road story of Luke chapter 24. The risen Christ meets two travelers on their way from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And if you weren't here last week, I'll try to recap in these questions. Pressing question number one. Did your son Bryce get his money for the raffle? Specifically, did I fund the raffle? I did not. Wait, wait. Here are, here, here are some conversations we have had. And for those that are listening online, I will read for you. Me. Your raffle request was in my sermon yesterday. Everyone keeps asking if I have funded it yet. Bryce, what they say about it? They want me to win, huh? (laughs) Me, I said to the crowd, what do y'all think he wanted? Everyone said, money. Bryce, haters. (laughs) And then I love this. If I don't win, I'm retiring from the raffle game. And one more later, Bryce, you can still bless me with some currency before if you desperately want to. (laughs) To which I went, ha, ha, ha. And I'd like to let you know that Bryce will get paid tomorrow and fund his own raffle. He thanks all of you for your concern. And I hope none of you lost any sleep this week over the fact of whether or not he had actually been able to enter into that raffle. I didn't know it was going to be such a cliffhanger. But everywhere I went this week, did Bryce get his raffle money? And even as I said it today, the crowd was conflicted over whether or not I should have done it. I love that. And now to the second pressing question. (laughs) How did you make the connection between Plato's symposium in its introduction, and Luke's telling of the Emmaus story. Well, a recap. The end of the Gospel of Luke is the exact mirror, the same story told in the introduction of Plato's Symposium, one of the best known philosophical books throughout the Roman world in the first century. And that was written about 450 years before the events on the Emmaus Road. In the original story, two disciples are not walking to Emmaus. They are on their way to Athens. And a teacher joins them to open their eyes, to open their heart. And it isn't Jesus, it's Socrates. And ultimately, they arrive at a dinner party as Socrates disappears before the first course is served. And I asked you last week, what are we to make of this obvious case of plagiarism that Luke has committed. And I answered with T.S. Eliot. Immature poets imitate. Mature poets steal. Bad poets deface what they take. And good poets make it into something better. So Luke, by intention, by design, has not imitated Plato's work. He has outright stolen it. Not to vandalize it, not to tear it down, but to improve upon it. To use it as a means to tell his own story about Jesus. Luke, in a stroke of narrative genius, is putting Jesus into a story that his readers and listeners would already be familiar with. He is aiming squarely at the Greco-Roman audience, introducing Jesus as true wisdom. Jesus as true enlightenment. He is revealing the Christ as the trustworthy teacher, the guide to show us the way. It's one of the most clever adaptations anywhere in the New Testament. And it's nothing new. It has been there all along. But for the most part, we were unaware of it. So to that question, how did you make the connection between Plato's symposium and Luke's telling of the Emmaus story? Well, that's a story unto itself. It's a story that is now 17 years old. 
a story that begins in the winter of 2007. A simple faith was just a few months old in the winter of 2007. And we were still hammering out our place in the faith community kaleidoscope. And I was trying to find my own voice, trying to do spiritually, I think, what Thoreau did physically when he went to the woods. And if I could paraphrase his words for my use, he said, simplify, simplify, simplify. To drive faith into a corner, reduce it to its most genuine terms, discover its true meaning, and publish that meaning to the world. And I, I'm still trying to do that. That early attempt, though, became the first series of sermons that I have ever shared here. Well, it wasn't here, it was somewhere else, but you know what I mean. And the research for that project began in 2007. And I preached the series beginning in January of 2008, and I entitled it, The Journey, Away from Religion and Toward Jesus. And that series joined Jesus in Luke chapter 9, verse number 51, one sentence, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He was leaving Galilee and headed toward his own death at the hands of the religious and civil powers of the day. And Luke, in another of his clever adaptations, follows this journey for nine explosive chapters, stacking up stories building his gospel to its apex with the cross and the resurrection. Scholars call Luke chapter 9 to Luke chapter 18 the great journey. And I said of that journey back in January of 2008, quote, Luke gives us a self-aware, courageous Jesus who set his face like flint, who knows that his journey is fraught with dangers, who knows the religious and imperial powers of the day will crush him, who knows this journey will cost him his life. Still, he travels toward the city that stoned and killed its prophets. He must, for this is his calling, his destiny, and his vocation to reveal the identity and true nature of a loving God, though this world's powers would rather kill that God than to be loved by that God. This little series became this. The book published in 2009, Leaving Religion, Following Jesus. This is not a publishing commercial, however. This was a punchy little controversy. <laughs> Thank you, Garrett. <clears throat> I live in a world of squirrels. They're just running around doing nutty stuff all the time like that. Well, it was a punchy and controversial little book, the title especially, so much so that no pastor would ever even want me to come speak with that as the subject title. It was a little frightful. My only regret all these years later is that I didn't punch hard enough with this book. If I wrote that book today, it would be even more punchy. Not for the sake of being contentious. Nobody wants to intentionally be contentious. But for the fact that the longer I stay at this, the more radical and more revolutionary Jesus becomes all along. And so when I realized that these talks would become this, I really had to dig into my research because the footnotes and the sources have to be even better than the writing. And so deep into the scholarship I went, and it's there that I discovered Charles H.H. H. Scobie from Mount Allison University, David Mosner from Texas Christian University, making all of these connections between Plato and Luke. And then there was just this academic rabbit hole that I fell down into. Revelation upon revelation, mind-blowing creativity by Luke. And so I've been sitting with this, chewing on this, and loving on this for 17 years. So pardon me if I'm struggling to get it all out in just a couple of Sundays. 
I'm just now talking about it and to what end. Well, these are my goals. Number one, there's always something deep, innovative, and wondrous beneath the surface of Scripture. It's a bigger story than we have been told. There are worlds beneath the text. And two, as I said last week, Luke was not afraid to meet people right where they were to tell the story of Jesus. That's why he adapts a story that they already knew. And I'll get to more about that later because Jesus isn't afraid to meet people right where they are. That's a large part of what this story is about. And this is the third one, the thought that I did not complete last week, but I'm going to do my best to complete it this week. Can we just stop and appreciate the artistry, the effort, and the creativity of Luke. And what he has done in just a few verses to paint a magnificent masterpiece. And to do that, I'm going to read to you again the story of the Emmaus Road. But I'm going to read it to you from Mark's Gospel. It is also there, but in a much redacted form. So this is Mark 16. 9 through 13. If you're with me, say amen. amen. Off we go. After Jesus rose from the dead, early on Sunday morning, the first person who saw him was Mary Magdalene. She went to the disciples who were grieving and weeping and told them what had happened. But when she told them that Jesus was alive and she had seen him, they didn't believe her. Imagine a group of men not believing the one woman who shows up. Afterward, he appeared, watch this, in a different form to two of his followers who were walking from Jerusalem into the country. They rushed back to tell the others, but no one believed them. Two things. Mark says that Jesus appeared in a different form. In all of your reading of the New Testament, have you ever noticed that before? In the Greek, it is adjusted configuration. Heteros morphe. Jesus, the shape shifter. Even though we don't know exactly what that looks like. And then the second thing, Mark's account is two sentences long that's it he can't even begin to describe what happened on that country road mark is the primary source for both matthew and luke mark is the oldest of the gospels written down and so what you have to imagine is this that mark writes his gospel down short punchy to the point matthew comes along picks up mark's gospel and says ah oh, I don't have to start from scratch. I'll just start with this. Matthew contains 90% of the gospel of Mark inside of it. Plagiarize everywhere, right? And then when you move to Luke, Luke does the same thing and uses 50% of Mark in his. And I think what happens is he gets to this little verse right here. Afterwards, he appeared in a different form. And Luke, the creative genius that he is, says, oh, I can do something with this. And he adapts the story to reach people with the story of Jesus. And I'm going to show you what I mean by this. Number one, this is an image of the night sky. And I know it's hard to see. It's, it's so bright in here. But typically, we can't even see this much of the sky at night because of light pollution. But here, the stars are bright. Now, specifically, this is a view looking eastward toward the rising sun. More specifically, this is the night sky over southern France. And more specific still, this image was captured on a summer night just outside the French city of Avignon. Next slide. This, too, is an image of the night sky. Specifically, it is a view looking eastward, awaiting the rising sun. More specifically, this is the night sky 
in southern France. And more specific still, this image was captured on a summer night just outside the French city of Avignon. The first image is a photograph. The second image, this is Vincent van Gogh's masterpiece, The Starry Night. Van Gogh painted this work while recovering from a mental breakdown at the asylum at St. Rami. His stay there produced many of his most valuable and recognized works. 150 of his paintings exist from this one year long hospitalization. And there must have been something about looking east from his room that he found especially intoxicating. He painted, sketched, or drew 21 different works of art from his second story window. The Starry Night here is the only nighttime production and it exceeds them all. Vincent wrote to his brother this, when I have a terrible need of shall I use the word religion, then I go out and paint the stars. And I absolutely want to paint a starry sky. It often seems to me that night is more richly colored than the day, having hues of the most intense violence, blues, and greens. If you only pay attention to it, you will see that certain stars are lemon yellow, others pink or green blue. Forget me not in their brilliance. And I love this line. It is obvious that putting little white dots on the blue black is not enough to paint a starry sky. Now, let's look at the images side by side. A photograph of a starry night and Vincent van Gogh's interpretation of a starry night. I ask you, which one of these is of the nighttime sky over the French countryside? Both. Which one is real? Both. Which one is true? Both. Which one is correct? Both. Which one is amazing? Both. So think of Mark as the photographer and think of Luke as the painter. Think of Mark as telling us what happened and Luke interprets what happened. Mark can only talk about an adjusted configuration that he won't begin to describe. But Luke has the language and the story for that description. Mark gives us facts, we might say. And Luke gives us metaphor and imagination. Mark is a reporter. Luke is an artist. And there is something about when an artist put paint, puts paint on canvas, when an artist pulls an image out of stone, or puts poetry to paper, or speaks a story into existence, there's something about it that captures us that draws us in like simple facts and observations can never do. Now in the gospel, Luke does this time and time again. Luke has a young man come to Jesus and ask a question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And what does Jesus say? Love God. Love your neighbor. But those are just little dots on canvas. So Luke instead goes on and tells the story of the Good Samaritan and puts the listener into the story, drawing artistry, story, pictures of what that commandment actually looks like. Some people come to Jesus complaining because He's welcoming sinners and tax collectors and sex workers to this party. And Jesus begins to tell them about the inexhaustible grace and love of God But that wasn't enough. So instead, Luke has Jesus tell a story about the prodigal son. This wondrous, maybe the greatest story ever told about the collision of God's grace when it happens and it looks like the reconciliation between a broken child and a heart-sick parent. I can go on and on like this. It's Luke's style. And as Van Gogh would say, isn't it obvious that putting little white dots on the blue-black is not enough to paint? A starry sky. I'll go back to Van Gogh. Writing to his brother Theo. He says so well what Luke has accomplished for us in this story. Slide if you would. 
the great artists, the serious masters, show us in their masterpieces what leads to God. One writes it in a book or tells a story, another in a picture. I must continue to follow the path I am on. If I do nothing, if I study nothing, if I cease searching, then woe is me, I am lost. That, that is how I look at it. Keep going, keep going, come what may. My great longing is to be understood without words, to make these paintings more true than the literal truth. Not everything in the Bible is a literal commandment to be obeyed. It's certainly not a battlefield upon which to fight, where we war with each other over every jot and tittle. And honest to God, we have done the Bible and ourselves a disservice by reducing it to just a repository of religious doctrines. I have come to see the Bible less about God speaking down to people and more about people reaching up and trying to speak with God. It is this grand, complex narrative of humanity trying to figure ourselves out, trying to figure what God is all about, trying to map out our place within this obviously faulted world. And within this story, within this community, there are some real artists who pull us into the questions, who draw us into the exploration. And Luke is one of those great artists. And this is what I was getting at last week when I said, if you read the story of the Emmaus Road, only as literal, historical, empirical proof that Jesus rose from the dead, you will actually miss what all this story is about. If you get fixated on the proof of the story, you miss the purpose of the story. Luke is not out to prove anything. He is making an appeal. He isn't arguing. He is inviting. He is not presenting evidence of the resurrection. He is calling each of us to explore what the resurrection means. He doesn't care much about speaking with inerrancy, but with imagination. Because this is not a story to debate. It is a journey to join. That's what Luke is after. This is not a simple snapshot of the sky. This is paint your palette blue and gray. Flaming flowers that brightly blaze. Swirling clouds and violet haze, weathered faces lined in pain are soothed beneath the artist's loving hand. And now I understand what you tried to say to me and how you suffered for your sanity, how you tried to set them free. They would not listen. They did not know how. Perhaps we'll listen now. Do you know those words? Of course you do. Those are words from Don McLean. He will be forever known as the writer and performer of American Pie. That classic anthem that captures the early history of rock and roll. Bye bye Miss American Pie. Drove my Chevy to the levee but the levee was dry. Them good old boys were drinking whiskey and rye. And singing this will be the day that I die. We've never done that song here. Because we would have to start a half an hour earlier. Just to get it in. But my favorite song of his. Is Vincent. And it's from Don McLean that I first learned so much about Van Gogh's story. His creativity, his mania, how he suffered likely from bipolar disorder and epilepsy, the taking of his own life. Vincent never set out to be a painter. He set out to be a preacher. He didn't last at it long. He came to understand his higher calling, showing us his masterpieces that lead to God. Here's an excerpt from his first sermon and then a, a prayer as well. This sermon was preached the 29th of October, 1876, and it could have been spoken about the Emmaus Road. I'll begin a little earlier than that slide. It is an old belief, and it is a good belief, that our life is a pilgrim's progress. Indeed, we are pilgrims. Our life is a long walk, a journey. But for those who follow Jesus Christ, 
There is only a constantly being born again. A constantly going from darkness into the light. Only a life that is constantly evergreen. I once saw a very beautiful picture. It was a landscape at evening. In the distance on the right hand side a row of hills appeared blue in the evening mist. Above those hills the splendor of the sunset. The gray clouds with their linings of silver, gold and purple. Through the landscape a road leads to a high mountain. On that road walks a pilgrim. Staff in hand. He has been walking for a long while already. And he is very tired. And now he meets a woman. It is an angel. And then Van Gogh seamlessly inserts the words of Italian poet Christina Rossetti. Does the road wind uphill all the way? And the answer is yes. To the very end. He asks again. Will the journey take the whole day long? And the answer is. From morning until night, my friend. But the pilgrim goes on. Though the road is long. For he is bound for that eternal city. And he ends that sermon with these words. We come from afar. And we are going far. Heaven is with us. Helping us. And guiding us. Giving us strength day by day. Hour by hour. So let us put our hands to the plow on the field of our heart. Let us cast out once more. Let us keep going. And now, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us forevermore.